Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We are going to give it a few minutes to allow people to enter the room and join us. Hope everyone is enjoying their post-Halloween candy coma and getting ready to uh, start the Thanksgiving season. And I hope everyone is also very excited to start um, our November as our Lung Cancer Awareness Month. Um, and we are very excited to share this webinar with you today. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, we'll allow people to join in. Um, so my name is Casey Faber and I am the Associate Director of Cancer Centers for the American Cancer Society in Ohio. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the event today. We ask that if you have called in from a phone, that you please enter your name and organization in the Q&A so we have a record of your attendance. All lines will be muted during this program, and we ask that all questions be entered into the Q&A tab on your screen. We will be taking questions during our panel discussion and at the end as time permits. If we do not have time to answer your question during the Q&A, we will work with the presenters to have your question answered post-event. On the next slide, just wanna share how glad we are that you are here with us today. And we're gonna go ahead and start off uh, our webinar with our first poll question. So for the first poll question, we are gonna have you go ahead and select what state are you coming from? And we know we have some new states that are joining us today that may be on this poll. And welcome, welcome, welcome. But we like to see approximately where our attendees are coming from. You may have to scroll down a little bit on this poll as well. If your state isn't in this poll, please go ahead and enter that into the chat as well so we know how to update this poll for next session. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and end this poll. And welcome to those I see from Ohio, West Virginia, and Michigan, and welcome everyone else as well. On our next slide, I just want to take a moment to uh, thank our sponsor. None of this would be possible without the generous support of the Ohio State James Comprehensive Cancer Center. Also, thank you to the Ohio Partners for Cancer Control and Mountains of Hope Comprehensive Cancer Coalitions, as well as the Michigan Cancer Prevention Task Force for their continued support. On the next slide, we'll go over our agenda for today. We're going to begin with our welcome speaker, Megan Landry. Uh, then we're going to have four presentations, and we're going to follow that up with an excellent panel discussion moderated by our very own Dr. Kathy Goss. Finally, we will conclude with a message from the National Lung Cancer Roundtable. On the next slide, we'll go through the uh, this, the stuff, are the, the legalese, I guess. Um, so the AAFP has reviewed the Health Equity and Cancer Care Virtual Series Lung Cancer Webinar and deemed it acceptable for up to 2.0 Enduring Materials Self-Study AAFP prescribed credits. You will receive a certificate to claim your CMEs within two weeks following completion of the post-event survey. Our objectives for today's event can be seen on the current slide. Please note that the planning committee members and speakers have declared that there are no relative financial arrangements or affiliations with the organization that may affect balance, independency, objectivity, or scientific rigor for this CE event. Also, please know that slides will be available after the presentation and this event is being recorded. And now it's time for the second poll. What is your role or sector as it relates to lung cancer and what best describes your relation to lung cancer? And hopefully we'll see we have a really great variety represented in this question. Thank you for answering that. And again, welcome from your sector. On the next slide, it's my pleasure to introduce our first guest, Megan Landry. Megan began her career at the American Cancer Society in 2014 
and currently serves as the Associate Director of Cancer Center Partnerships in Michigan. In her role, Megan brings with her the perspective of a cancer caregiver, experience leading fundraising events, and a passion for advocacy. Megan currently leads the Michigan Cancer Prevention Task Force made up of representatives from 34 health-based organizations across the state of Michigan. Megan also serves on the board of directors for the Michigan Cancer Consortium and the advisory board for the Carmanos Cancer Institute Office of Cancer Health Equity and Community Engagement. Please join me in welcoming Megan. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. And good morning, everybody. I'm excited to be here today uh, during Lung Cancer Awareness Month to talk about such an important topic. You can go on to my slides, Megan. Terry Carolyn, John Carolyn, and Matt Gumbel. Three individuals who, by looking at them, you may not see any commonalities. All three of them were larger than life personalities. Each of them was the kind of person that would drop everything to help someone else. They all liked to crack jokes and got a kick out of making others laugh. And they all fiercely loved their children. And they were all very dear to me. Terry was my aunt, John was my dad, and Matt was my brother-in-law's brother, which seems like a lengthy connection, but our families were very close and he was like a brother to me. They were all diagnosed with and eventually died from lung cancer. Two of them were non-smokers and had genetic mutations that caused their lung cancer. One of them was a lifelong smoker. I'm not gonna tell you who was the smoker because that doesn't matter. The very first question I got and still get to this day when I talk about any of these three family members and their diagnosis is, did they smoke? I've thought about this a lot and in some ways, I think folks desperately want a reason for something happening. We don't want to have cancer or for our loved ones to have cancer. So if we can find a reason for why it happened to someone else, we can maybe have some hope that it won't happen to us. But when you ask that question, whether it's intended or not, it translates to, oh, they smoked, of course they got cancer, or even, well, then they deserve to get cancer. No one deserves cancer. We need to reframe our thinking. Our duty as friends and family is to support a person and their caregivers through the journey, not to judge that person's behavior. There have been research studies that show that patients with lung cancer, whether they smoke or not, felt stigmatized. I want to make something clear. Stigma against lung cancer is a burden and a barrier. It can lead to loneliness, isolation, and depression. Lung cancer patients could delay treatment for fear they are being judged. A stigma could and has negatively impact funding for lung cancer research, which is critical to continue to find the best treatment options. Not all smokers will develop lung cancer and not all lung cancer is caused by smoking. Anyone with lungs could develop lung cancer. All three of my loved ones, my Aunt Terry, my dad, and Matt were gone far too soon, and I can't bring them back. I can't go back in time and change anything that would result in a different outcome. But what I can do is share their stories and show you the real faces of those with lung cancer. <clears throat> Each of them fought hard, and they did not lose their battle to cancer. They finished their fight. And now it is up to me and their loved ones and all of us to carry on their legacy and continue to advocate for other lung cancer patients and their families. Thank you. Thank you so much, Megan, for reminding us why we're here today and why we are doing what we do. Um, we really appreciate you sharing your story. Then on the next slide, um, I will get started by, uh, it's my tremendous pleasure to introduce Dr. Kathy Goss, um, who will be hosting us uh, for our speakers and our panel portion. Dr. Goss joined the American Cancer Society in April of 2021 as the North Central Region Vice President for Cancer Support and currently serves as the Senior Vice President for Partnerships and Capacity Building. She has a wealth of leadership experience and a passion for the Society's mission. She's a longtime cancer 
cancer advocate and served as a dedicated volunteer with the society and ACS CAN for more than 19 years before joining the American Cancer Society in this role. Dr. Goss launched her research program on the molecular drivers of breast and colorectal cancer at the University of Cincinnati and then moved her laboratory to the University of Chicago in 2007. She brings tremendous uh, leadership to this role, tremendous experience, and on a personal note, she's a leader that inspires me on a regular basis for her passion for ending cancer as we know it for everyone. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Goss. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm so thrilled to be with you. And I just want to give, um, first of all, Megan Landry, um, thank you so much for sharing your story. You've really uh, grounded us all this morning um, and given us that important um, perspective that we need as we have this really important discussion today. Um, and also just thanks to um, all of you for attending, of course, we have a, a treat for you, a fantastic group of speakers, um, and I'm really looking forward to a terrific uh, panel discussion with them. So without further ado, let me um, introduce our first speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sandeep Kashap. So Dr. Kashap is a cardiothoracic surgeon um, at Charleston Area Medical Center in Charleston, West Virginia. He completed his general surgery residency at Waterbury Hospital, Quinnipiac. Uh, he'll have to tell me how to pronounce it, Quinnipiac. <laughs> Thank you, University, um, a fellowship in cardiothoracic surgery at Indiana University School of Medicine, and then um, a minimally invasive thoracic surgery fellowship at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. Um, we are thrilled to have you here, uh, Dr. Kashap. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and the opportunity to talk about something I'm very passionate about. And we can go to my slides, please. Okay, lung cancer biomarkers. Uh, my uh, only disclosure is I'm a thoracic surgeon, not a medical oncologist. And uh, next. Lung cancer kills more Americans than breast, colon, and prostate cancer combined. Next. We look at this slide and we say 50% uh, of the cancers uh, that are diagnosed today, the lung cancers are diagnosed in stage four and the survival rate is uh, at a dismal 8.2%. Even if diagnosed at an early stage, uh, there's 52%, 3% three year local recurrence rate for uh, stage three a lung cancer. But however, there is hope because if we diagnose and treat uh, stage one lung cancer, there's a five year overall survival rate of at least 90%. Next. Historically, there were limited treatment options, and the treatment was linear, in which um, all uh, cases of lung cancer, especially the non-small cell lung cancers, were treated with a combination uh, platinum-based chemotherapy, and the survival was not very impressive. Next. With the success of the Human Genome Project, we had two major paradigm shifts, the emergence of targeted therapy and immunotherapy. Next. As we see lung cancer today, it's not a single disease. It's small cell and non-small cell lung cancer. However, the non-small cell lung cancer identified as squamous and non-squamous, that's the adenocarcinoma, is further subclassified based on the spectrum of its oncogenic drivers, or as we're gonna learn, the biomarkers. Next. What are biomarkers? Biomarkers are the molecules or uh, these receptors, cellular characteristics, that are present on cells that can aid in diagnosis, can determine clinical outcomes, or specific response to treatments and interventions. They shift the focus from development of non-specific cytotoxic chemotherapy to specific molecular targeted therapeutics. Next. Biomarkers can be diagnostic, which help diagnose what kind of cancer it is, can help to determine prognosis, or predict whether a particular drug can act and treat a particular type of cancer or not. Next. About 64% of the patients with non-small cell lung cancer have oncogenic driver mutations that when identified and used for treatment may lead to a favorable patient outcomes. So there's definitely a rationale for using targeted therapy. 
how does targeted therapy work? Hey, here you see a cancer cell, and that's the cell membrane of the cancer cell, and that has a common receptor that's identified. That's a tyrosine kinase receptor, which, when the cancer cell goes rogue, the tyrosine kinase receptor is activated, and it undergoes cell proliferation uncontrolled, as well as decreased apoptosis, and causes cancer invasion and metastasis. The specific receptor antagonist, when introduced, the tyrosine kinase receptor antagonist, it blocks this pathway and prevents cell proliferation and increases apoptosis. Next. And development of such an uh, agent against the epidermal growth factor receptor, EGFR, changed the targeted therapeutic landscape for us. And EGFR is the most common uh, receptor uh, that is targeted. However, KRAS is the most common uh, mutation that is seen in uh, non-small cell lung cancer, non-squamous. EGFR, however, is very common in non-smokers in Asian population and in women who get lung cancer. Next. The entry of using personalized therapy for lung cancer using uh, EGFR uh, targeted therapy in patients who had such mutations increased the survival um, and started improving the survival next as we started using specific targeted agents for EGFR um, mutated uh, lung cancer patients. Next. As we started to develop better uh, therapeutic uh, agents, a third generation ECA, EGFR antagonist, the median overall survival improved even higher. Next. So there's much more to identifying just the histological diagnosis of uh, adenocarcinoma. And then we identify the specific oncogenic driver, the specific mutation. And sometimes, uh, even if you're using the EGFR antagonist in a patient who has a mutation for EGFR, they may not be responding. Then we have to dig deeper. Is there the specific type of mutation that we are targeting is present in this tumor or not? And then we have to identify the subtype or uh, different heterogeneous EGFR mutations and find out if we can target that particular mutation that's present in this patient's tumor. Next. So biomarker testing, as uh, you can see, is continues to expand, is critical for treatment in lung cancer. The, there are approved drugs for EGFR uh, with common mutations as well as the exon 20 mutation. Uh, the anaplastic lymphoma kinase, the ALK, the rest are uh, less common, but still important as ROS, RET, NTRAC, BRAF, MET, and KRAS. Next. So let's talk about immunotherapy and role of PDL1. Under normal circumstances, the adaptive immune system, that the normal immune system attacks tumor cells and infection cells. And in, in, in case of today's discussion, the tumor cells and identifies it foreign and kills it. There is an immune checkpoint molecule called PDL1, the program death ligand 1, which helps to switch off the activated T cells so that it doesn't go destroying the normal tumor cells. I, I mean, the normal, um, normal body cells. However, the tumor cells can hijack the system by expressing PDL1 on their cell surface. And this tricks that the activated T cell to thinking that the tumor cell is a normal cell and does not uh, destroy it at all. So, next, PDL1 can be identified by immunohistochemical assays and uh, is classified as either PDL1 uh, low or high at a 50% rate. Next. So, the PDL1 inhibitors block the inhibitory effect of PDL1 on the T cells so that the T cells can remain activated and continue to attack the tumor cells as tumor cells and not identify it as normal cells. And this is how the immunotherapy works, that it strengthens the innate immune system. Next. PDL1 biomarker absent, less likely to benefit from immunotherapy. A PDL1 biomarker present at a higher level, more likely to benefit from immunotherapy. Next. In presence of actionable mutations, which we detect through molecular profiling, if there are targets, then the targeted treatments seem to be better. With the expression of PDL1, if it is identified, then it's a discussion as to whether immunotherapy is going to be a good um, treatment as part of the multidisciplinary uh, treatment that we're going to offer. Next. 
there are a whole host of trials which I'm not going to go into, but just to say that there's a lot of research going on in the world of lung cancer with therapeutics and immunotherapy. Next. A few things, however, I do want to mention is this, everything is not about stage four lung cancer anymore. It is because we are identifying cancers in early stage and we want to make an impact in early stage lung cancer and prolonged survival. A Dura study is a phase three study which um, tested patients who had EGFR mutation who were in stage 1b to 3a non-small cell lung cancer with or without adjuvant uh, chemotherapy after the section. If they had EGFR mutation, received osimertinib versus placebo, and it showed a disease-free survival rate of 83%, which was uh, tremendous in this study. So biomarkers make an impact in early stage and adjuvant therapy. Next. I operated on a patient who had, uh, she was an EMT um, from uh, Martinsburg, West Virginia. She had a five centimeter middle lobe cancer, which she received preoperative uh, chemoimmuno when this trial came out, uh, the keynote, uh, I mean the Checkmate 816 trial, where um, we give preoperative chemoimmuno for patients with stage 1B to 3A if they do not have EGFR or ALT receptor, irrespective of their pdl one status, then they, after the chemoimmuno, they undergo surgical resection. And after surgical resection, in her case, as seen in this, there was a 24% complete pathological response that there was no tumor after I removed the right middle lobe in her. This was numbers that were unheard of in lung cancer before. Next. So how do we test for these uh, biomarkers? So it can either be a single gene testing or a multiple gene testing, depending on um, the, the multiple gene testing is also uh, called the next generation sequencing. Next. There's also a liquid biopsy, which uses either a cell-free DNA or tumor cells. And this can be used for diagnosis in future screening, but definitely in the near future for surveillance and lung cancer. Next. The specimen that comes for biomarker testing can either come from pleural fluid, it can come from tissue after surgical resection, it can come from a biopsy, which can be a CT guided biopsy or a bronchoscopic biopsy. It can also come from a lymph node, which can be from an endoscopic um, ultrasound, uh, there is a bronchoscopic ultrasound EBUS, and can be used for biomarker testing. Next. We, in this overwhelming uh, world of biomarkers, we look for uh, certain uh, recommendations like from uh, institutes like NCCN, next, which has given recommendations that can you can look up as standard of care for non-squamous and squamous uh, non-small cell lung cancer. What are the biomarkers that we need to be testing for? Next. IASLC recommends multiplex sequencing panels as standard of care. Next. In spite of all this, there is a lot of gap in biomarker testing where my lung consortium data showed only 46% of the patients overall and 49% received at least five biomarker testing. And the new generation sequencing was done only in 37% of all patients. There is significant racial disparity as well in which the black um, patients who had lung cancer had uh, significantly less biomarker testing. Next. So the barriers can be multiple. Uh, it can be payment, uh, abnormal the tissue quality, or it can be lack of knowledge, or it can be a high turnaround time. Next. IASLC did a survey which showed that the most common cited barrier was cost and the quality of tissue was next. Access that the patients were not followed up or uh, had access to the appropriate treatments. The turnaround time was more than 10 days or 14 days and people didn't want to wait for that for treatment. And awareness was uh, also an important factor that we didn't, uh, the providers just didn't know. Next. The biomarker testing can come through the pathologist or the oncologist, and it can be reflux or testing as needed. And each has their pros and cons, and we can discuss this in the discussion. Next. So reflux testing can lead to a higher implementation of 
all the identification of all the targetable genetic alteration where the pathologist tests every single specimen that's uh, sent to them. And, but it also has a cost implication to it. Next. Next. Uh, establishing uh, algorithm for biomarker testing is the best way to make it standard in your institution to uh, identify how and when the biomarker testing needs to take place. Next. A multidisciplinary treatment team is the core of success and everyone needs to be talking the same language and using the same support so that the patient has the best outcome. Next. We have a long way to go in terms of lung cancer in our country and especially in the state of West Virginia where I'm practicing. Next. So the survival uh, nationally is still uh, 25%. And one of the main things that I wanted to uh, plug anytime I get to talk about lung cancer is lung cancer screening. As seen here, uh, lung cancer screening is approved since 2013, but only 5.8% of those who are eligible were screened in 2021. Next, lung cancer impact pyramid. Uh, the lower uh, parts of the pyramid is where we can make the maximum impact is management of incidental lung nodules, lung cancer screening and preventive measures. Next, lung cancer screening save lives. So you would probably know someone who would smoke, you see a patient who would be a candidate for lung cancer screening please set them up for screening and so that we can diagnose their cancer early and give them a chance of having a long and successful life. Next. Lung cancer is one of the most common cancers and leading cause of cancer death. So biomarker testing plays an important role in making treatment decisions that improves patient outcomes. Guideline testing and multidisciplinary treatment is what is going to change the trajectory of lung cancer in the United States and the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kashap. That was fantastic. I, I feel um, that was such a great way to start us off and really uh, really ground us in the science and the, and the um, current state of uh, lung cancer treatment. So thank you so much. That was, that was really great. So I'm really um, pleased to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Brian Yeh. So Dr. Ye is a board certified radiation oncologist who specializes in proton therapy treatment for central nervous system cancers, head and neck cancers, lung cancer, lymphoma, GI cancers, breast cancer, and pediatric cancers. Dr. Ye has over a decade of experience in using proton therapy to treat cancer. He served as a radiation oncologist at the um, New York Proton Center and at the Procure Proton Therapy Center in New Jersey. He's one of the few that have completed special fellowship training in proton therapy at MD Anderson, and his residency and internship training was completed at UCLA. Dr. Ye participates in clinical research and has co-authored peer-reviewed publications studying proton therapy, uh, treatments for head and neck cancer, breast cancer, and pediatric cancers. He's held uh, faculty appointments and taught medical students and residents at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, where he, where he also was the director of proton beam therapy and at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Dr. Ye, we're so thrilled to have you here and turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I also wanted to share, um, you know, something about proton therapy is a sort of a targeted um, radiation therapy for um, lung cancer. So sort of like um, Dr. Kashab mentioned earlier about um, targeted molecular therapy, this is sort of more of a targeted radiation therapy, and I'm I'm happy to share share this. Um, next slide, please. Um, um, so my talk is a proton therapy for lung cancer, um, and um, next slide, please. So this is actually just a picture of an x-ray therapy room. Um, x-ray therapy is conventional radiation therapy. It's available at thousands of um, hospitals and centers around the United States. Um, and so this is just a, a, just your typical x-ray therapy room. There's a, I don't know if you can see, there's a table in the middle with a pillow on top. That's where the patient um, would, would lie down. And the machine is right behind the patient right there. And it moves around the patient and delivers x-ray therapy. Um, I want to talk about something called proton therapy, which is a little bit more focused. And if you go to the next slide, I'll show you why it's more focused. Um, this is a picture in gray. It's sort of, this is um, how much radiation dose is delivered um, as x-rays or protons enter the human body. And so on the bottom, you have penetration depth in centimeters. 
Um, and so this is as, so the gray is the x-ray. So you can say as x-rays enter the body, um, and you can imagine here, I have this tumor at about maybe like 17 to 22 centimeters. You can see those dotted lines on the top of this tumor there. You can see how x-rays enter the body, they treat the tumor, but then they also exit the body. There's dose delivered both where the tumor is, as well as in front and behind the tumor. Um, protons are shown in orange here, and it's a little bit different. Um, protons, um, they enter the body, they treat the tumor, but then they stop. Um, and I tell my patients, protons are sort of like a marble traveling in water. Um, you know, as they enter their body, they start to slow down and then they stop at a certain depth. Um, if I need the protons to go to a deeper depth, if the, if the tumor's at a deeper depth, I make the protons go faster and they go deeper. Um, if the tumor's at a more shallow depth, I make the protons go at a slower speed and they go to a more shallow depth. So the main advantage of protons is that um, there's no dose um, behind the tumor um, because they do stop, they still have to enter the body. And so they still, there is some dose given as the protons enter the body, so it's not perfect. Um, but they're much better than x-rays. Um, and so I'm going to, um, proton therapy is available about 40 centers um, around the country today. Um, and there's more centers opening. I think actually, so I'm in Michigan and we have two centers in Michigan, um, but there's about 40 centers around the country. I think Ohio State, just because they're one of our sponsors, they're opening one later this year. Um, next slide, please. So this is a picture just of how protons work or how we generate them. Um, we actually have a tank of hydrogen gas, which is not in this slide, um, but we take a hydrogen atom. Um, you can see there's in the bottom something called the Linux injector. What that actually does is that actually strips off the electrons from the hydrogen, um, and then you're left with a proton. And we use magnets. Actually, magnets can accelerate charged particles. The proton is positively charged. Um, and so that injector injects the proton, something called the synchrotron, which is a circular thing over there. You can see towards the middle of the slide, and that's a circle. And what happens then is the proton goes in that circle, and every time it goes in the circle, we get it, we make it go faster and faster. There's magnets that sort of push it along. And then when it's at the correct speed, it sort of goes off the synchrotron and goes off into the treatment room. Um, the next slide just show a picture of a treatment room under construction. So this is actually, well, this is actually just the gantry portion. And you can see here at the bottom, there's a little guy. Uh, I, I, there's this picture on the right. Yeah, there's a little guy in the bottom. And just to show how big the machine is. The reason why is because the protons are traveling typically around anywhere, typically around two thirds the speed of light. That's really fast. It's sort of like a race car. And uh, we have this thing called kinetic rigidity. What it means is that like a race car, when it's turning, it can't make a sharp right turn. It needs to turn very slowly. And so you can see here in pink and red, these are the magnets that turn the protons. That's why we need so much space because when we want to turn them and aim them precisely, you know, at the tumor within the patient, we need a lot of space. And that's what this, this is called a gantry. This is what this is about. Um, so the patient actually is treated in that little middle of the gantry there. You can see the picture. There's a little bit of, there's like these little, um, I don't know what to call them, like these little, we, we call them articulated floor. There's like these little um, plats. If you go to the next slide, we'll show what the patient sees. Um, so actually at the bottom says this, this is articulating floor. This thing called the couch, that little black um, little couch is where the patient would lie down. Um, and then we have something called the nozzle and the snout. Those are actually where the protons come out. So the patient, we don't have the patient see that huge room because that'd be sort of scary. We also don't want the patient to fall and hurt themselves. And so we have, we, we, we create a smaller space for the patient that's more comfortable and it's safer for the patient to be treated. Um, so what are the advantages of proton therapy and lung cancer? Go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is actually just a comparison of proton versus um, x-ray therapy. IMRT stands for intensity modulated radiation therapy. It's just sort of a fancy term for x-ray therapy. And um, you can see here, this is a patient being treated with proton therapy. We actually designed a x-ray plan on the bottom just for comparison. And outlined in yellow, and you can see around that red, red area. So the, where, where, the, where, the, where the radiation dose is being delivered is where there's color. And you can see in that red area, that yellow circle, that's actually where the tumor is. Um, and you can see here, that big oval in the middle of the picture is actually the heart. And as you can tell, but you can see here that the, um, the proton therapy delivers much less radiation dose to the heart. Um, there's less damage to the heart. Also, I don't know if you can tell, but on, on the bottom left-hand corners, the black areas are lung. And you can see here, the proton therapy focuses the radiation just where the tumor is, doesn't go to the other parts of the lung, whereas with x-ray therapy, it does go to other parts of the lung. Um, now, proton therapy is typically advantageous, you know, for, it's not advantageous, it's not, there's not always a benefit for every patient, um, but it is beneficial for some patients. This is an example of a of a, you know, of a patient where it's beneficial for. Um, next slide, please. This is just another example here. Um, you can see here, this is again on the left is x-ray therapy, on the right is proton therapy. 
And you can see again here, and, the, and again, the tumors, that red area in the middle, um, and color is where the radiation is going. And you can see here again that the, with x-ray therapy, there's a lot more radiation going to both sides of the lung, both the left and the right. Um, whereas with the um, proton therapy, it's focused mostly on the right. Unfortunately, in medical imaging, everything is flipped left and right. So the, the right lung is actually on the left side of the picture. <laughs> Hope it's not too confusing. But you can see here that with x-ray therapy, both sides, both the right and the left lung, do get some radiation dose. Whereas with um, proton therapy, um, only the uh, right lung um, gets radiation. This makes it safer. There's less, I mean, there's less damage to the lungs. Um, there's less damage to the heart. Um, and there's fewer side effects for patients. Now, proton therapy is sometimes a little bit more complicated to plan. Just next slide, please. Um, and this is just a, a little movie showing why. Now, that little gray area in the middle there, that's sort of in the red area, that's actually the tumor. Patients breathe uh, while they're being treated. Um, and so, and one thing I forgot to mention is that protons, they travel a little bit further in air than they travel um, um, when they go through the tumor. So here is a patient, the patient's breathing. And you can see that in order for me to treat the tumor, I need to treat because the patient's breathing and I don't want to miss the tumor. I have to treat the entire trajectory of as the tumor moves up and down, but that affects how the protons move because obviously when the tumor is in the bottom part, when the, when the tumor moves down, I'm still delivering protons on the top part because I need to cover when the tumor moves there. And the, tumor, the protons move a little bit further, um, but it's still better than x-ray therapy. So this is an example just showing that when we plan for proton therapy, because I have to calculate the speeds, um, it's a bit more complicated and it takes a little bit more calculations. Um, and the machine is, I forgot to mention, the machine is much larger. I showed you the pictures that I mentioned. The machine is much larger. Um, but this is a form of treatment that is much better um, for patients. And, you know, we're very excited as there's more and more proton centers, um, you know, being, I mean, opening around the country. There are proton centers. I know that we have people from New York. There's proton centers in New York, New Jersey, um, Georgia, as well as Virginia. So we have a lot of um, proton therapy centers that are um, already open and a lot more that are opening in the future. I know Ohio, Ohio State has an opening very, very soon. So we're very excited about that. Um, and then just one other thing I want to show is that here at my center, um, next slide, please. Um, here at my center, um, you know, in, um, in Michigan, we're working on making proton therapy be more comfortable for patients. Um, and so we're just actually designing ways for patients to actually be seated while they're being treated. And um, these are for, these are just, this is an example of a chair that we're working on here with a company um, called Leo Cancer Care. Um, and basically we're trying to um, create, because a lot of times with patients with lung cancer, they have a difficult time lying flat, um, either because of back pain or because they just don't breathe as well. So we're trying to work on ways where we can treat them in a seated position. And these are for different types of cancers. The one in the middle where it says thoracic region, that would be the, a, a patient with a lung cancer we're trying to treat. You see the box that right the lungs. We're also working on treating um, you know, tumors in the pelvis, that's in the picture on the left, or breast, which is sort of in the middle towards the right, also in the head and neck over on the far right. Um, and so we're excited. This, we also think, will also help make protonic therapy or radiation therapy more accessible for patients, more comfortable and more accessible. Um, and that's all I have. My last slide is just a thank you slide. Um, so thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to answering any questions on when I'm on the panel. Thank you so much, Dr. Ye. Um, and just another reminder um, for folks, as uh, we've got two more presentations to uh, use the chat or the QA um, features to submit your questions for our speakers. Um, okay, let's move on to our next presenter. So we next have Dr. Julie Agney from Ohio State University. So Dr. Agney is a palliative care physician an early career investigator whose research centers on implementation of palliative care, services for patients and care partners during cancer care. In 2018, she implemented an embedded, um, an embedded palliative care clinic in thoracic medical oncology for patients with advanced lung cancer. She has published research, research on logistical barriers to outpatient palliative care delivery, the impact of palliative care on healthcare utilization, and expansion of the catchment area of palliative care through an embedded clinic model. Dr. Agni is a recipient of the 2023 NCCN Young Investigator Award for her project on remote symptom monitoring with patient triggered referral um, to palliative care um, for symptom management. She's also a member of the ACS National Lung Cancer Roundtable Survivorship Task Group. Thank you so much for participating. Um, the NCCN Adult Cancer Care uh, Pain Guideline Panel and current chair of the AAH. PM outpatient special interest group. Dr. Agni, so pleased to have you um, and the floor is now yours. 
Thank you so much. I can start my presentation. I'd like to talk today about palliative care as a communication resource for promoting health equity in cancer care. Next slide. Palliative care is a medical specialty for anyone living with a serious illness. We focus on treating symptoms and stress of the illness with the goal of improving quality of life for both the patient and their family. Next slide. When I think about palliative care and explain it to my patients, I tell them to envision their health as a bridge. It's an avenue to complete your daily activities and those tasks that you wanna do in your everyday life. When you're diagnosed with a serious illness like cancer, that bridge comes under stress and it can be more difficult to do the things that you want or need to do every day. Palliative care can be the trust or the support under that bridge to help prop you up so that you can continue living your everyday life while you are dealing with the treatment or side effects of your cancer care. Next slide. A few years ago, the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer released a very thoughtful language guide recommending uh, changes to how medical providers and people in the community talk about and talk to anyone with a lung cancer diagnosis. The first tip that they gave was use first person language. We recognize that no one wants a label and they especially don't wanna be labeled by a medical diagnosis or condition. It's a major shift for a lot of us to change language that we've been using for a long time, especially in our medical practice. But I've been working really hard with our division, our medical providers and our trainees to use different words. Instead of saying lung cancer patient, can we say patient or a person with lung cancer? Next slide. It's very important for all of us to eliminate, eliminate blame language when we're talking about really anyone with a medical diagnosis. And this, this is tricky as well for medical professionals. A lot of times when we're documenting or when we're discussing our patients, we may say that they are non-compliant with their medical therapy or non-compliant with their medications. The issue with this statement is that it's close-ended and it's judgmental. It's more effective to say, a patient was unable to take a medication because. They were unable to complete a test because. That statement creates a ellipses at the end in which you're required to explain what is actually going on in the patient's care. Were they unable to take a medication because it made them nauseous? or there's too many pills, or it's too complicated, or they don't have transportation to get to the test or the appointment. There's usually an explanation behind why someone is unable to do what we've asked them to do. Patients don't progress, the cancer progresses. Patients do not fail treatment, treatment fails the patient. These are important thoughts to keep in our mind when we're talking about our patients, and we should use that language and document it in the medical record in the same way. Next slide. We must all strive to end stigma. As we heard earlier in this webinar, if you have lungs, you can get lung cancer. It does not matter whether you're a smoker, a non-smoker, or former smoker, anyone with lungs can get lung cancer. If you need to document tobacco use or discuss tobacco use, then again, we need to stop using labels and to refer to a person first, a person who smokes, a person who doesn't smoke, a person with a smoking history. I also wanna stress that it is important not to use the word addict we should try to remove the word addict from our language. And the reason is, is because addict is a label. It has negative connotation and it places blame. Substance use disorder, tobacco use disorder, alcohol use disorder, these are medical diagnoses that we strive to treat. So therefore we should use person first language followed by the diagnosis, a person with tobacco use disorder, a person with nicotine dependence. Next slide. 
So where does palliative care fit in to lung cancer management? I like to highlight some of the communications and conversations we have on a daily basis in our clinic um, to show how we as palliative care providers can help. So this is a common scenario that unfortunately happens way too often in that a patient may um, be undergoing cancer treatment and the cancer progresses. And nowadays, a lot of times our patients have the results of their last scans before they walk into their medical oncology appointment. So in an appointment, an oncologist may be thinking, you know, I wanna recommend a new treatment. And a patient or a family may be thinking, I'm really worried about my last scans. Next slide. And so the conversation may start like this. Unfortunately, your cancer has progressed and I think we should start a new treatment. And as a patient or as a family member, knowing this knowledge, you may be thinking, what's next? Where do we go from here? Next slide. As medical providers, we have a lot of information that we need to and want to share. Risks, side effects, lab work, scans, treatment schedules. And as we go into all of that information, as a patient, you may be thinking, okay, I understand, can I do this? What, what do I need to worry about? Next slide. As medical providers, so commonly, we go through all of our information and we give all the details that we want to give. And then we have an ask, a recommendation, something we want the patient to do. I need you to go get that lab, have another scan, have another biopsy, go see another specialist. I need you to get stronger, eat more, gain weight. I need you to stop smoking, stop drinking. And after you've received really difficult news and a lot of information, sometimes those asks can seem insurmountable and it really can cause a spark that triggers an emotional response that can be overwhelming and just too much. Next slide. So as a palliative care provider, my job is to check in with the emotion. And sometimes I'll be in the room when our oncologists are speaking to patients. Sometimes I'll come in after. Sometimes it'll be a completely different day or time. And I start by acknowledging the elephant in the room. You've heard some really hard news today. And then I check in. How are you feeling? That's an invitation to talk about the emotions behind what is going on. I'm always amazed how candid our patients are. They tell us they're worried, they're sad, they're disappointed, maybe uncertain. Sometimes it's too much to talk about. And a patient may say, I, I'm okay. I don't want to talk about it. Sometimes if a patient says, nothing's the matter, nothing's wrong, then I wonder, do you understand what is being said? Or is it just so stressful that you need time to process? Next slide. I try to follow up my questions with what did you hear today? It's always interesting what we tell patients or what we think we tell a patient or a family and what is actually heard and what is actually understood. And by asking someone to say what they've heard and what they've understood, you then have an ability to see where they are, check in emotionally, and make sure that the important details and the important information that has been said has actually been received. Next slide. So how does this look at our institution at Ohio State? In 2018, we started a different type of clinic. We had a palliative care clinic that um, was located remotely from our lung cancer clinic, about two miles away. And we recognized that patients didn't seem to be coming out to our clinic and receiving palliative care. So we embedded a palliative care physician into our thoracic oncology clinic so that a patient could see medical oncology and palliative care at the same time in the same location on the same day. Next slide. And the results of that embedded model were striking. We know that at Ohio State, we have a large catchment area 
people from many areas, including rural areas across Ohio, come to Columbus to receive cancer care. Oftentimes, they're able to make the drive in to receive their cancer care, but to ask them to make a separate drive in for a palliative care appointment is very, very difficult. And so by combining palliative care and oncology care in the same space at the same time, we found that we were able to reach more patients from a wider geographic area. Next slide. And the result of embedding palliative care in oncology care is that our patients had less ED visits, less hospitalizations, less ICU admissions. And yes, it does translate into cost savings for our patients, but more importantly, it's time savings. Less time in the ED in the hospital is more time spent at home. We saw improved symptom control. We were able to give medications in clinic to treat uncontrolled symptoms. And we provided an extra access point for patients to reach out whenever they were having problems. Next slide. So in conclusion, words matter. Be thoughtful about the words you choose. It takes practice, but it really makes a difference. Palliative care providers are trained in serious illness communication as well as symptom management. We're available for those who want to use us. And embedding palliative care within oncology clinics can increase access to supportive care for patients after cancer diagnosis. Next slide. I'd like to thank our wonderful team that made our embedded clinic possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Agni. That was fantastic and really um, I, I'm excited to have um, a discussion with you about some of the points that you raised, which are just so, so important about how we uh, use language and provide the support that so many patients need um, and, their, and their families, of course. Um, so our final speaker is uh, Jody Diesler. So Jody is the Revital Oncology Rehabilitation Director. So she's been working um, as a treating uh, physical therapist for over 30 years and brings that tremendous knowledge and experience um, for her presentation today. And specifically, she's been working in oncology rehabilitation for the last, more than the last 10 years. Uh, the Revital mission, which I'm sure we're, we may hear a little bit more about, is to make cancer rehab the standard of care so that everyone impacted by cancer has access to rehabilitation services. Jody, thanks so much for being here. Good morning, thank you for having me. Um, we'll go ahead and start with the first slide, please. So again, my name is Jody Deisler, and I'm a physical therapist and the Revital Program Director. And our job in therapy is to help patients get back to living their lives, uh, whether that's before cancer, during cancer, after, all the way through that whole continuum. Next slide, please. So this is a little bit about the why behind cancer rehab. Why is it needed? 60 to 90% of patients will have a need for some sort of specialized oncology rehab care during their cancer journey, but historically only two to 10% have gotten a referral. So our goal is to make cancer rehab a standard of care. So not just some patients get it, but all patients who need it get it. Now rehab is really different for cancer treatment than it is for like an orthopedic issue. It's often only a few treatments versus maybe 10 or 12 if you're having something like a knee replacement surgery. So we customize our, our treatment plans to address the individual needs and goals of the patient. We certainly realize that oncology patients face many appointments and there's an overwhelming cost to the care of cancer. So we strive to make every appointment both meaningful and important and what will fit into their lifestyle most importantly. Uh, we offer telehealth if proximity to healthcare or travel expenses an issue. And I wanna give you an example of a functional problem we might address in cancer rehab. I had a patient who was a handicapped school bus driver and I actually saw her after she was completely done with her cancer treatment. She'd already had surgery, she had her chemotherapy or radiation. At a time when she should have been really excited, she came to me with a lot of stress and anxiety because she was unable to return to work. Uh, she wasn't able to reach overhead to hook the harnesses. She couldn't, uh, didn't have enough strength and endurance to push the wheelchairs up onto the bus. And so we worked on that kind of thing in the clinic. Uh, we would set up some work circuits, some strengthening, some range of motion, worked on her endurance, and we got her back to work. But that's the type of thing we might work on in cancer rehab, uh, whether it's someone getting back to driving a school bus or a nurse that uh, maybe it doesn't have feeling in her fingers and has to program IV poles 
or a mom who just wants to take care of their kids or a grandparent who wants to be able to get out and do their regular walks. Our job in rehab is really just to get patients back to living the lives they were living before this diagnosis. Next slide, please. So early intervention is really important. Prehab or the term prehab is seeing a patient prior to their first big event, whether that first big event is surgery or chemotherapy. This is done for lots of reasons, but mainly to establish baseline measures so that we can help monitor their global strength, their frailty, their response to treatment. It also checks for impairments. And most importantly, it begins education process. So in the lung cancer population, we might teach patients prior uh, to surgery, things like incentive spirometry, diaphragmatic breathing, how to transfer less painfully, how to brace their incisions. All these things are much easier to teach when patient doesn't have pain prior to surgery. They're also much more compliant. If they have a couple of weeks to work on those things prior to surgery, it's much, much more easy for them to do it after surgery. We also get them started on an exercise program. Now, when a patient is seen for prehab, they generally have to be seen for less visits because we're being much more proactive in our approach versus reactive. And sort of looking at this chart, what it's really showing is that we know patients are going to have a dip during treatment, but if we build them up prior, that dip is not going to be as, as steep. And then hopefully what we'll see is some decreased hospital stays, uh, improvement in dyspnea, improvement in their physical performance status. Next slide, please. Now this is a study on lung cancer and it was done to determine if patients with lung cancer who were considered inoperable could meet criteria to become operable following a pulmonary prehab program. There were 216 participants, all non-small cell lung cancer. The prehab program was carried out by physical therapists twice a week, 70 minute sessions. Respiratory muscle training was performed, cardiovascular exercises, education, and a home program to be given for three times a day. And what they found was there was a good improvement in dyspnea, their physical status, their frailty levels, their activity levels, and it helped optimize these patients to continue with their treatment. Uh, as those uh, patients that had been defined as high risk for surgery, 54% ended up going on to surgery. So some nice research to show the importance of getting patients moving. And we'll move to the next slide. So research shows us that uh, uh, cancer rehab really helps improve things, but things I always like to point out is it really can help improve length of hospital stay. That's really important. Uh, it really improves their physical performance staff, helps improve their mental uh, capacities, and really dyspnea, as we know, is important for lung cancer. Next slide, please. So historically, when people think of uh, cancer rehab, they think of lymphedema. But as you can see, there's a lot of other areas here we treat. And in the lung cancer population, one of the most common things we treat is fatigue. Of all the cancer types, fatigue is the number one symptom with lung cancer that we treat. Uh, other things we might see patients for are dyspnea, poor posture to improve their uh, breathing mechanics. Uh, CIPN, chemo-induced peripheral neuropathy, balance, falls, radiation fibrosis, all different things we might see in this lung cancer population. Next slide, please. Now, education is really important so that our therapists really understand the effects of cancer, the surgery, and all the anti-cancer treatments. So our uh, clinicians have to go through online modules, in-person classes, case studies, tests, quizzes, ongoing maintenance. Uh, any physical therapist or occupational therapist can see a patient with cancer, but I think it's really important for the patients uh, that those therapists really understand the effects of cancer and the treatments. Next slide, please. And this is just my information. If you have any information about, you know, what prehab is, any more further explanation or patients that might be appropriate for uh, rehab in general. Oh, and that's all. Great. Thank you so much, Jody. That was fantastic. Um, so I would love to welcome all of our speakers um, sort of to our virtual panel. Um, and so if you can turn on your cameras um, and we will get the conversation started. And I think we're even ahead, a little bit ahead of schedule, if I'm not mistaken. So um, 
cheers to all of you <laughs> for for getting getting us um to that point. I think if if I'm if I'm correct there. Um so I would encourage all of you to um, submit your questions either through the Q&A or through the chat. Um, well, I would love to take your questions, um, but let's get us started with a conversation um, around disparities and barriers to care since the focus of this um, session is really about health equity. And I know this is something that touches all of you um, in your uh, in your work every single day. So let's start off the conversation about disparities. And certainly we know that there are significant disparities in lung cancer incidence and mortality for various um, racial and ethnic groups, um, certain rural populations, certainly um, and access to care has um, a lot a, a lot to do with that. Um, I would love to hear in your own, um, in your own practice, in your own work, what do disparities look like um, for you? Um, certainly in the, um, in the treatment space, in the palliative care space, in the, um, in the rehabilitation space, I would just love to hear more about those disparities. So maybe we can start with you, Dr. Kashap. Um, you talked about Certainly you talked about barriers to biomarker testing and, and personalized medicine, but, um, and we can get into what, um, what folks are doing to tackle some of those barriers, but can you first set the stage around the disparities that you see and the field in general sees? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, this was such a great and inspiring uh, talk and in leading up to this um, discussion, I'd say uh, overall, um, removing the stigma of lung cancer and having uh, patients um, seen by the treatment providers uh, is is going to be key. And uh, in terms of uh, disparity, apart from the ratio, there is also, uh, I would also say there is disparity in terms of, you know, rural as well as mm -hmm. uh, access to care. And um, what uh, yeah, I hear, uh, you know, especially uh, primary care providers, mid-level providers uh, not really um, understanding what um, needs to be done and what is available so that, you know, we uh, make an early referral to a place which has a multidisciplinary team so that we can, um, you know, get, uh, get them to the right um, treatment and, um, you know, they, so that we don't lose these patients. Because what I see is a lot of patients Every time I see a patient who's diagnosed with a stage four cancer, I, I go back and check where was the point at which we could have determined and caught this patient at stage one. Why wasn't a scan done for this patient? Why wasn't this patient in the lung cancer screening program? And you know, and then we uh, see if it was a provider that's in within our network, and then we send a message to them and say that why uh, you know just to as an education, just as a reminder that this could have been done so that the next patient, um, you know, falls on path uh, directly. Yeah, um, absolutely. That, that really resonates. And um, it's, it's really that entire continuum that we need to address um, along the way and where we can make sure that um, folks aren't falling, falling through the cracks. Um, Dr. Ye, I would love to hear from you um, from, you know, the proton therapy perspective and your patient population at Carmanos, um, I would love to just hear more about what are those disparities that you see, especially as you said, um, there aren't that many proton therapy facilities across the country. Yeah, so, well, they're building, hospitals are building more. Um, proton centers are very expensive. And so, um, you know, but hospitals re realize that this is an important um, service that they have to provide. And so um, more and more hospitals are building um, proton centers, so we'll see more. Um, obviously, one disparity is the fact that not everyone is within driving distance to a proton center currently. It's only about 40 centers around the country. That's not really enough. Um, but hospitals are aware of this, and they're working, um, you know, they're working to address that issue. It's just, it, it does require investment. Um, I just wanted to just sort of continue on from, you know, Dr. Kashup's com comment about CT screening. Um, you know, it is, you know, lung cancer, when it's stage one, it's highly curable, um, you know, either with surgery or with radiation therapy. 
Um, and, you know, just sort of, I think, bigger picture, I think one issue is, um, you know, a lot of patients don't have primary care physicians. Um, you know, um, I mean, the, a lot of places where I've practiced, you know, a lot of times patients, um, maybe it's, I hope, I hope it's less, but there was a time when patients would use the emergency room sort of as a primary care, um, you know, I, or I guess like a, you know, as, as their primary physician. Um, although, you know, primary care doctors do a lot more, right? They do a lot of the cancer screening, whether it be, you know, a, you know, CT, the CT of the lung, um, or colonoscopies, um, you know, or pap smears. I mean, these are things that can catch cancer when it's very early and highly curable. And so um, I do think that, you know, maybe a bigger picture is just the, and we all do know there's a shortage of primary care physicians. And it's in my, you know, in Michigan, it's, it's hard to find a primary, you know, a lot of times my, my, my patients want a primary care doctor, but the primary care doctors are full. Um, you know, and so I, 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 but I do feel that primary care physicians, when it comes to diagnosing cancer early, catching early while it's still curable, um, you know, primary care, you know, primary care doctors are very important. Um, and, you know, we are, we are in the process of building more, you know, um, you know, at more, can, more proton centers around the country, but I guess we need both more proton centers and more primary care physicians. I guess that's the way I see it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, there's a number of rate limiting steps is what you're, is what you're saying and bottlenecks um, in the system. Um, Jody, I'm going to, I'm going to switch to you for just a moment around rehabilitation, um, and, and disparities that you see there in your practice. Um, I can imagine, um, that certainly, uh, for certain populations, um, you know, that, that from a financial perspective, maybe can't prioritize something like rehabilitation services after a, a, after a diagnosis. So can you tell me about what you see in your practice and, and ways that folks have been trying to tackle some of those barriers? Yeah, certainly in the rehab realm, some of the big barriers we see are transportation issues, um, you know, financial issues, either no insurance or limited insurance. Um, and really one of the biggest barriers we see is just a lack of knowledge about cancer rehab, not only from the patients, but from physicians not really knowing that that's something that they can refer patients for. Um, so that's sort of one of the big things that we've worked on is really educating physicians that, hey, if you can get patients to us sooner, they won't have to come as long. We can get people on, on a more proactive you know, approach and see them for fewer visits and not have to really take a lot of their visit time. Um, and really meet patients where they're at, um, whether that's telehealth because they're in a rural setting and there isn't something near them, or maybe they have limited visits. And so we need to do some telephone conversations and, um, you know, limited time in the clinic. Um, but that's really how we've tried to work around that a little bit is um, helping, you know, not only patients, but physicians know that, you know, the sooner we see these patients, the less time it's going to take and less impact it's going to have on their life. Because most patients, when they come to see me, you know, are a little confused. What is what is oncology rehab? Uh, everyone's really familiar with orthopedic. If uh, if they have a knee replacement, they know they're coming for physical therapy and they know what's going to happen. When they come to oncology rehab, usually my first question is, what are you going to do? <laughs> what are you going to do to me? You're not going to cure my cancer. So no, that's the doctor's job. My job is to get you back to all of the things that you're doing prior to your cancer diagnosis. You know, if you were a tennis player before, I want you to be a tennis player after. If you were working as a nurse before, I want you to be able to get back to that job. Um, so that's more where our, our job comes in. And um, as I said, seeing patients earlier certainly makes that a lot easier. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and, and so important for quality of life and survivorship for these patients, um, as, you, as you've pointed out. Um, Dr. Agni, I would just uh, ask, you know, when, when we say meeting patients where they are, I think, you know, that really resonates for some of your remarks about making sure that we're um, speaking uh, the language that, that, you know, um, individuals with cancer and their families can understand um, and, and, you know, being really cognizant of that. Um, what are the what are the barriers that you see that drive um, cancer disparities, um, particularly for lung cancer patients, um, in particular around that language issue, um, not only um, related to some of the things you talked about, but also sort of health literacy in general? Yeah, thank you. There's 
there's so much to unpack in that in that situation. Um, so education um, has a huge impact, um, not only your level of education, but just the amount um, of healthcare exposure you've had during your life. You may have fantastic education, but if you haven't been around healthcare, you may not understand the language or the um, the words that are being used. I also find the big disparities um, lie with whether or not you have um, close family or a caregiver or someone to listen into those conversations. So often um, I see a patient who comes to um, our oncology clinic without a support person of some kind. And there's so much that's running through your mind as a patient during cancer treatment um, that you only can can hear and process maybe a fraction of what's actually being said. So actually having a support person with you um, is really, really important. Uh, for some people, that's just not possible. Maybe you don't have family nearby. Maybe you don't have a close friend who can come with you to appointments. Um, and, and, that's, and that's really probably the bulk of the disparity is, do you have someone who can come with you, listen to what's being said and process some of that information as it's being delivered? Yeah, that is so important and really taking the time to work with work with people and let them process um, in their own way. Um, we have a, a question in the chat, which I really appreciate. Keep them coming, everybody. Um, and the question is, how could how could uh, we better leverage mid-level providers to close the gap for patients without a primary care physician to improve access to lung cancer screening? I know we touched on screening a little bit, um, but you know, it's really how do we how do we leverage who we have um, to really fill in some of that gap? Thank you. I can take that. Uh, you know, mid-level providers are definitely going to be the key, and the more the navigators are uh, going to be the key, like cancer navigators and lung cancer uh, specific navigators. The lung cancer screening team uh, is built around the multidisciplinary team, which has the nurse as well as the nurse navigator, who then trains the other mid-levels who are, um, you know, referring the patients as uh, automatically, which comes as, um, you know, either of lung rads 4B, it automatically gets referred to the nodule clinic. And till then they have not seen uh, a physician and they are automatically coming into our uh, discussion without having seen a physician. Mm -hmm. And the more and more we are able to do that, and, you know, and, and the next step in many of the patients are, you know, a, a referral to a thoracic surgeon. And um, we talk about it, it looks suspicious for cancer. Let's get a PET scan. And if that's negative and it's a localized lesion, you're going to go for surgery. So imagine like taking the step from not having seen a provider, reaching out through a mid-level and seeing a thoracic surgeon and getting a cure. You know, so I, I think mid-levels are definitely going to be the answer. You know, I, I, we say probably we are not to say that they can um, minimize what the primary care uh, physicians can do. I, I absolutely would love to say that, you know, we are going to have all those primary care providers that we need, but that's, that's, that's not going to happen. So we need to train the PAs, we need to train the NPPs and other mid-levels, and they are definitely going to be the answer, um, you know, for a successful lung cancer screening. Thank you. Thank you. Really helpful. I'd like to um, I'd like to pull on the thread um, and go back to you, Dr. Kashap, for just a moment around um, biomarker testing in particular. What is the uh, and certainly access to care? Um, and you've again, you've talked about some of those barriers. But what is the sort of healthcare ecosystem doing overall? What are some things that are, you think are working or, or need to be a focus of attention for the ecosystem to make biomarker testing more accessible, more, um, you know, more available in uh, more diverse settings so that, you know, we can really drive, continue to drive improved outcomes for lung cancer? You know, that's that's a great question. I um, was thinking about uh, that and another point that I'll uh, bring up at the end of this. 
So uh, I think it's just been so good and overwhelming for us because there is so much change that's happened in such a short amount of time in lung cancer. And it, it's just also exciting. And and so the standard of care keeps changing. It's uh, every every year, every six months, there's something new. Uh, and so the education piece to it is going to be key as well as, uh, you know, making these kind of things that, you know, are NCCN recommendations, part of what an institution that is doing cancer care is supposed to be doing, you know, in terms of uh, whether if you're, if you're not doing that, then, you know, identify the barriers to which uh, we can improve access. So currently the multi-panel gene testing seems to be answered, but it's, it's not it's not definitely covered and it's not, you know, that tests for about 50 genes where you know, most of the times we are able to make the decision with just three markers. So in our tumor board recently, there was a discussion as to why are we spending all this money to get the multi-panel gene testing as standard where we can make a decision with just three, uh, you know, testing with, with single gene testing. So uh, I don't think we have a standard of care or uh, you know we have a final uh, decision yet so i would say continue um, the education and improve conferences like this so that it it becomes common knowledge it becomes the language that we talk about this was not something that we used to talk about on a regular basis it used to be that one isolated patient who are not responding to chemotherapy let's think about something else but it has to be Every single patient that is diagnosed with lung cancer should be asked the question, do they have any targetable mutations or biomarkers that we can think about? So that's the change that we need to bring to the education right at the medical school and at the mid-level provider level that you know, lung cancer is not just a histologic diagnosis. It's a diagnosis that comes with an oncologic mutation. I, I'm so glad you framed it that way because, you know, we're just in a different environment now and the science continues to evolve. And so the way that we um, approach this has to, and it has to be a commitment, right, from, from all sectors to say that this needs to be um, front and center. I would just um, add from an American Cancer Society perspective, when you touched on um, education, we are really proud um, at ACS, we've driven uh, or, or developed and um, run some uh, lung cancer biomarker testing ECHO series um, across uh, multiple states. And we're just launching an, a third cohort um, of, of that project. And that's been driven through the National Lung Cancer Round, ACS uh, National Cancer Lung Cancer Roundtable that you're going to hear more about um, in a bit. But, um, but it really is at that education piece, making sure that providers really understand all the nuances and the latest science um, and are really uh, teaching one another. Um, so that's an important piece. And I think that the other thing I would just mention is, is also um, from a policy perspective, making sure that there's access to care and coverage for individuals to be able to get biomarker testing um, done. And, and that's, a, again, a, a priority for our advocacy arm at the American Cancer Society and lots of other organizations. And we're really proud of multiple states adopting biomarker, legis biomarker testing legislation um, so that, you know, we, we really, again, uh, take down that barrier of who can afford to, to get that testing done, because we know it's it's so important. So really appreciate you pulling on those threads. Yeah, absolutely. That was what I was going to bring up. The advocacy from a policy standpoint is what is going to make the difference, because right now Medicare covers it, but uh, you know state-based Medicaid, there are only about five states which are approved and 10 states which are applied for uh, biomarker testing. So uh, you know we, we have a long way to go uh, in terms of individual states. We do, and it just speaks to having to come at this from, from all perspectives. Um, so a question for you, Jody, um, from our chat. Uh, is there a certain continuing education program that you're using for your therapist um, 48 hours of training? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we actually, I'm part of a, a national program and uh, they developed the program within our uh, company. So it's a national education um, director who came up with the content and developed it all. Um, it's been going for about six years, I, th I believe, six or seven years, I think we've had Revital. But, you know, oncology rehab has been around for a long time. It's just not been as well known. It's really in the last, you know, six or seven years that more people know about it and have utilized it, I think, as um, cancers have become uh, in many busy states, more chronic illnesses than terminal. We're seeing people live longer and want to have good quality of life. And I think that's where that's come about is that training. Terrific. Thank you for that. Um, so Dr. Ye, a question for you, and this really gets to um, the financial burden of cancer care, especially for lung cancer patients. Um, and the question is about proton therapy and, and insurance coverage. Could you speak to that for us? Yes, yeah, so that's a very good question. It does. Um, so proton therapy is a little bit more expensive than traditional x-ray therapy. Um, it is typically covered by insurance, um, but sometimes insurance companies, you know, in their and their desire to control costs, you know, they, you know, they sometimes they'll deny it. We, I, I do spend some time, you know, working with insurance companies to sort of what we call appeal those denials. It is covered by most insurance. Um, I would say it is. Um, sometimes we have to file an appeal, um, but we usually get it covered. Um, but it is, it is, it's not a lot more expensive. It's about maybe, you know, 10 or 20% more expensive than traditional extra therapy. Um, and so some insurance companies um, don't approve it the first time around, but usually we're able to work um, with insurance companies and convince them that it is better. And you can see from the pictures I showed that it is better. It's just a matter of educating them because it is, it's also newer. And as partner centers are opening in parts of the country uh, where insurance companies, you know, didn't have to sort of approve or, or, or deny, you know, that, that there is a little bit of education part. I mean, it's, it's a, I guess it's part, partly the responsibility of the partner centers to educate the insurance companies about the benefits of proton therapy. So that, that's part of it as well. Education is a common theme here today, um, obviously. Um, so a, a similar question to you, Dr. Agni, about palliative care and the financial, um, the financial burden there and coverage of um, palliative care services. Yeah, absolutely. Palliative care is covered by most insurances as well as Medicaid and Medicare. Mm -hmm. um, we bill it in the same way as any other medical provider. We do run into insurance issues sometimes with some of the medications that we prescribe to control pain and other symptoms, and we submit prior authorizations for that to help mitigate the costs. Great. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, a question um, back to you, Dr. Agni. Um, is around a stigma that's come up a couple of times. And I'd like us to just talk a little bit more about how do we tackle this issue of stigma when it comes to lung cancer and the language that we use and how we identify individuals um, and, and what, we can, what can we do proactively? Again, a plug to the National Lung Cancer Roundtable. I know that stigma is, a real, is an important um, topic uh, for the round table that they're tackling, but I would love to hear, um, your thoughts on, on what the, you know, sort of the root of the problem, um, and then how can we really address it in a meaningful way? That's a great question and a common theme. I think it's so human for all of us to look for meaning behind something, um, particularly when something terrible happens, like a, a diagnosis of lung cancer. We look for reasons to explain why did it happen um, so that we can put assign meaning to it. And the, the truth is cancer happens. We don't ask for cancer. We don't want cancer. It's terrible. Um, and sometimes the, you know, focus on, you know, oh, it's because you smoked or because you used tobacco products, um, just gets in the way of just acknowledging that it's a terrible diagnosis and a terrible disease. And so I always encourage people to come at it from a point of curiosity. Um, if you know of someone who has a diagnosis of lung cancer, rather than trying to explain it, maybe think about you know the person behind it. How are you feeling? How are you doing? Is there anything that you need help with that I could help with. And that's really, I think the point that we need to shift rather than trying to explain why it happened. That's so important. Um, and really appreciate your perspective on that. Um, 
Uh, we've got a question about biomarkers, um, Dr. Kashap. So do you foresee biomarker uh, upfront, um, biomarker testing upfront for the high risk population, especially those who do not want to undergo a low dose CT scan? So in other words, um, you know, do we, do we think there'll be a, a, a modality for utilizing a biomarker um, related to um, screening, almost like a pre-screening as we have for some other cancer types and liquid, yeah, you know, from a liquid biopsy perspective, perhaps. From a liquid biopsy perspective, yeah. that would be the dream. I, I, I think, <laughs> I, I, I don't think we would have it for screening, uh, at least in the near future. I, I think we are so far behind catching up from what needs to be done for lung cancer screening. Uh, it, I, but what I uh, see happening uh, really is the combination of the lipid biopsy and the tissue biopsy where uh, we can try and slowly eliminate the need for a larger tissue biopsy to make these uh, treatment decisions. One, so that we can have pleural fluid or a small needle biopsy, uh, giving us the same information that we would have got from a surgical specimen. And the other uh, aspect that I would say is, uh, is coming up real soon is use of circulating tumor DNA for uh, surveillance, right? So that would eliminate the need for surveillance CT scans if we can prove and say that we can identify uh, patients who are coming back as a recurrence uh, earlier with circulating tumor DNA. And of course, it would be a dream to have a, a blood test um, and say that now it, I, 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 it would it would definitely happen, but we are, we are not there yet, but that is uh, definitely the way to think about for all the investigators uh, who may be listening or listen to this later, yeah. Still muted. You knew it was gonna happen at some point. Um, we need to have all those investigators keeping their their foot on the foot on the gas so that we can get to that get to that place. Um, I agree. So, Dr. Kashap, another question before you you uh, you hop off mute here. Um, do oncologists wait for biomarker testing or start a standard treatment until the results are in? And is there, you know, is it considered uh, harmful if it's a wrong treatment? So sort of the sequencing of events um, oh, that's and a how long question. that might yeah. take. Yeah. That's a great question. I, um, you know, obviously there was, there's was so much to cover and uh, I did have a slide for that. And uh, so, uh, it, it would be essential for the oncologist to at least wait for uh, EGFR uh, mutation, uh, as well as know the PDL1 uh, status uh, before uh, starting immunotherapy, because there's definitely data to show that if a patient has a EGFR mutation and does not receive targeted therapy, but receives immunotherapy, then the outcomes are worse and there's actually no response to immunotherapy in those particular patients who have the EGFR mutation. And so we would wait for the results to come back before initiating uh, treatment. And so that's where a uh, liquid biopsy model, where uh, the if we have a uh, a liquid biopsy in which the result comes back in about three days and you see that the patient has a EGFR mutation, then you're already uh, planning for targeted therapy and not thinking about, um, you know, immunotherapy. So in, uh, but if there is a turnaround time of about two weeks, then, uh, you know, we are at a point where we're thinking, can we wait two weeks before starting treatment for this patient. And once we start treatment and then we identify a different marker, then are we going to stop the treatment where which we've already initiated? So there is uh, still no perfect timeline, but uh, I think it would be advisable. And I think it is now standard practice to wait uh, to identify targetable mutations before uh, formalizing the final treatment plan. Sounds like it's a, a bit of a delicate dance there. Um, 
And, and I think the key also is making sure that patients sort of understand all of that, that you just shared that, you know, that there is a sequence and this is why, um, that that testing is so important. Um, so, you know, I think, um, making sure that, uh, that under level of understanding as best as we can get it is, is there for the, the patients and their families, because that waiting game can be, um, you know, excruciating for a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of patients. Um, uh, for Dr. Ye, um, do patients have any negative consequences from proton therapy? You talked a lot about the benefit, um, clearly from this, uh, targeted radiation treatment, but what about any negative consequences or side effects? So proton therapy is more focused than x-ray therapy, um, but it's not perfect. As I showed, there's still something called an entry dose. Um, there aren't any negative consequences in the sense of, I would say there's additional side effects, but sometimes the benefit from proton therapy um, can be reduced depending on where the cancer is located. I showed you pictures where the cancer is only on one side of the lung, like either the left or the right. Sometimes, you know, cancer can involve, um, you know, lymph nodes on both the left and the right lung. Like the cancer might start on one side of the lung, but you end up having lymph nodes on both sides where when patients get radiation therapy, those both essentially both sides of the chest have to be treated. In those situations, um, the benefit of proton therapy is less. Um, and so I wouldn't say that initially there's negative consequences, but there are situations where the, there isn't as much of a benefit to proton therapy and patients could be well served with just x-ray therapy um, as well. In, in those cases, when you have, for example, you have lymph nodes that are involved on both sides of the chest, I would say that's an example. Great. Thank you. That was so helpful. Um, Dr. Agni, a quick question for you. I know, and I, so great that you shared the IASLC uh, language guide. Where can people find that? Yeah, you can go to the IASLC uh, website. Um, it's pretty easy if you even just um, Google okay. the language guide in IASLC. Uh, it's very helpful. It's a PDF and I, I find it's very well written. That's fantastic. Um, a question for, for all of you um, is around um, tobacco cessation and where that fits in to whether we're talking um, about patients uh, that may be go undergoing active treatment um, or ones that are um, being, being um, you know, have access to palliative care or certain, or certainly ones during during survivorship around um, uh, rehabilitation. So I'm just uh, curious if you could speak to that um, component around tobacco cessation. When I counsel patients um, about tobacco cessation, I treat it as any other healthy habit that they should be practicing, and I highlight all of the hard work that they are doing to treat and manage their cancer. Uh, I tell patients, hey, you're working hard to live and manage your life despite this really difficult illness. And so let's talk about other healthy habits that can help you live well with your cancer. And so we'll talk about tobacco cessation and we'll also talk about nutrition, healthy living, exercise, it's all part of the package. Um, and it also allows us to talk about those details um, without feeling stigmatized about their tobacco use. Yeah, I love that. That feels like the, the best approach possible. Any other um, comments so, about how um, that comes you know, up? Going, yeah, going back to lung cancer screening again, part of every lung cancer screening uh, program is uh, tobacco cessation. Each point that the patient uh, comes to see a provider, uh, not necessarily a physician, uh, they need to get a referral to a tobacco cessation clinic and given resources. And there is uh, data that when patients um, come become part of a regular screening program, the rate of tobacco cessation is higher than uh, when they were otherwise. So, um, you know, again, uh, I, it's it's so hard for patients to quit because the uh, the generation of patients that we see are not the younger generation of patients who picked up smoking recently. It's the patients who were smoking at the time when that it was just normal to do so. So, so it's so important to have conferences like these where the providers know how to take the stigma out 
and as well as you know give them the right resources because it's it's such a hard habit to quit and i'm i'm still looking for a perfect way that you know is it a app based mindfulness uh training or uh you know what what exactly i i really don't know i give the resources to the patients and i refer them but if they ask me um you know how how i would recommend quitting i would say you know i i don't know it's different for uh each person so if anyone has a perfect recipe that you can uh recommend i would i'd love to share that uh with everyone yeah i wish we all had that um but i think you're exactly right that everyone is so different um anything else to add around tobacco cessation dr ye or uh jody on this topic I just make sure, you know, whatever my patients need, I try to refer out if they need a medical counselor, you know, if they need a dietitian, if they ask for some help with smoking cessation, I just let them know in a safe environment that that's available and, uh, and, and connect them that way. So what, whatever that need may be, whether yeah. it's smoking cessation, dietitian, some counseling services, um, wherever they're feeling a need, um, that I just let them know we can help with it. I'll just echo that. Um, you know, I well, these, these are numbers of my patients, just so they understand what the benefit of, of what the detriment of smoking is. Uh, for non-smokers, the overall risk of lung cancer is about three in a thousand. Um, but you know, and this is very broad. But you know, when you look at smokers, it's increased by thirty times. So you're, you're increase your risk from three out of a thousand to now ninety out of a thousand. So now you're looking at nine out of a hundred. Um, what that means is that the majority of smokers don't develop lung cancer. Um, you know, but smoking has all these other health risks involved, heart disease, you know, and you also have other lung diseases like, you know, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And so I think just to echo what Dr. Agnes said about just, it's a healthy living. And I think that, you know, when, they, when they've been through cancer and they've been through all that treatment, it's tough. Um, and they're motivated, I think, at that point, you know, to sort of live more healthy. And I think sometimes that's helpful to just sort of encourage them in that way. Um, and also know that there's resources. Um, you know, I know in the state of Michigan, we have free counseling that we offer. Um, for patients to help, there's a, there's a phone number you call and you can get a, a free counselor to help. So I also tell patients a lot of times, there are resources, it's not just you by yourself, you know, trying. And so I also try to, I guess, um, you know, and I know, I think all states have similar programs where you can actually get a, a free counseling. And so I, I usually refer them to one of those counselors. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's exactly right. Knowing what those resources are, um, are so important and, you know, States have quit lines, um, and then in you know, and there are other resources um, certainly in within some health systems, and um, and additionally, um, you know, organizations like the American Cancer Society. We have additional resources. There's a there's an email um, a program that um, we like to refer individuals to called Empower to Quit. If you know, if email is something, again, it doesn't work for everyone, but if that's something that works um, for them, they have access to email and use email. It's actually um, has been proven, uh, you know, there's evidence that it's really actually quite successful in helping um, folks to quit. So I think getting the resources to folks is what's so critical. I'd like to just um, pull on that a little bit around resources um, and, and address the issue of social determinants of health or, or um, health addressing health-related social needs for this, for this population, again, in the context of the tremendous disparities that, um, that we see in lung cancer incidence and mortality. So, um, and Jody, I know you mentioned, uh, I think it was you that mentioned even transportation to get to a, a, a rehabilitation appointment can be a significant barrier. Can we talk a little bit about other barriers um, that, and, and how we try to address some of them, maybe through your experience um, and your practice, but also sort of overall the oncology community, how can we do better on that front? You know, from a therapy standpoint, transportation can be a real issue for some patients. And um, so some of our hospitals in the area have given out um, Uber and Lyft cards to help patient with appointments, um, not only for therapy appointments, but for all types of appointments. And I know that's been, you know, one strategy we've used to help um, patients get where they need to go. And just also connecting them with 
um, services that do provide free transportation. Sometimes there's senior uh, services for certain ages uh, that will provide free driving as well. So just really trying to, to connect them with the services where they can get that help. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure Dr. Agni in your, in your practice, that's an important component, um, is linking folks to resources as well. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and that's the main motivation for us combining palliative care with oncology care is um, because of transportation burden and appointment burden, um, after a cancer diagnosis. Um, there's also a lot of work being done in the field of telemedicine and what does telemedicine look like for supportive care services? Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of um, lobby action, um, trying to lobby for um, supportive care and palliative care to continue to deliver uh, medication management through telemedicine, even with controlled substances. Um, we're trying to make sure that we can reach our patients even if they can't come to see us. So important so important and has evolved, that whole field has evolved so quickly, um, thankfully, and has a lot of potential, but of course, again, additional barriers that we need to overcome um, for some patients. And uh, I'd be remiss if we were talking, we're talking about things like transportation and we didn't mention some of the support services um, for patients that we have at the, through the American Cancer Society, including Road to Recovery, which is a volunteer program for transportation. We provide um, transportation grants, for example, to health systems. Um, and so again, it's, it takes all of us to really be resourceful and committed to addressing some of these, um, these barriers. Um, we have another question in the queue, and this could, might be our last one, um, given the time, but um, it's really about, um, as we think about uh, lung cancer screening um, and, you know, and, and you mentioned, we've, we've talked about the rate of lung cancer that develops in non-smokers, um, those individuals without a smoking history. Um, how do we catch their cancer early? And, and can we talk about the hereditary component of the disease um, as it relates to um, uh, risk? Does anyone want to talk to that one? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so that's a very interesting question because right now uh, we uh, don't have a specific way other than, um, uh, you know, if you get to a point where uh, we had a patient recently who said, you know, he has a strong family history of lung cancer. So he just wants to get a scan. Uh, other than that, I don't think we have uh, in update, as we identify uh, more patients uh, who are non-smokers and we get data from them about what specific uh, biomarkers and what genetic tests that we can build, um, you know, to identify at least starting with the family, uh, followed by, uh, you know, uh, making it applicable uh, to the general public. But right now, um, I don't think there is any uh, recommendations for uh, even uh, patients or uh, family members of uh, you know, who have had uh, cancers like other some of the other cancers, but that's a very interesting and uh, important question that we need to address in the near future. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, let me take this opportunity to thank you all. Um, you are just uh, troopers about getting barrage with questions um, for for the last uh, the last little bit here, and um, but brought so much uh, depth to the conversation um, from your from your lens, and um, and so grateful for the information that you shared your perspective, and just this really important, robust conversation. As we think about, you know, how do we move the field forward? How do we continue to address the disparities and drive health equity in a meaningful way um, for this patient population, for those at risk for lung cancer, which is everyone who has lungs, um, and, um, and improve survivorship and quality of life for this, um, this group of individuals. So uh, really important, um, discussion. I'm so grateful to each and every one of you. And, um, and I would say if there are any last minute questions for folks to feel free to put them in the chat and our speakers uh, will, will answer them as they can. Um, but I'm now um, 
I am now turning it over to Casey um, for our next speaker. Thanks so much, everybody. And let me just echo uh, my sincere thanks, Dr. Goss, panel members. That was a tremendous discussion. It always amazes me that we are able to get such an amazing group of professionals and experts that have such interesting thoughts on our issues for these panels. And I don't know about you, but the time just flies by. Uh, it's crazy. Um, how you know, I would love to listen to each one of you talk for another 15, 20 minutes at least, um, because it was just amazing, amazing discussion. So thank you. And I'm going to be going and um, probably thinking about this all afternoon. So appreciate everyone's time and dedication to making this panel so excellent. Uh, so now we're actually going to take a moment for our next poll question. Um, so we'll see that on the screen. And this time, uh, we want to know, um, what do you observe as the biggest barriers when it comes to lung cancer health equity? So whether that be treatment or screening, um, and you are able to select more than one option on this poll. So this is just kind of a great way that we like to take the temperature for those of you who are out there doing this work. What do you see? What are you experiencing? I'll give a couple extra seconds for you to finish this poll. And while you're working on that, allow me to go ahead and introduce Dr. Ella Kazaruni as our next speaker. So Dr. Kazaruni is a professional of radiology and internal medicine at the University of Michigan Medical School, specializing in cardiothoracic radiology and the Associate Chief Clinical Officer for Diagnostics for the University of Michigan Medical Group. After medical school and diagnostic radiology residency at the University of Michigan, she completed a fellowship in thoracic radiology at Massachusetts General Hospital Harvard Medical School. She is a past president of the American Ro <laughs> Rotation Ray Society. I thought I had all the pronunciation worked out and then that word popped up. And the Association of U University Radiologists and the Society of Thoracic Radiology and the Radiology Alliance for Health Services Research a past trustee of the American Board of Radiology and has served on the ACR Board of Chancellors. Dr. Kazaruni is the current and founding chair of the National Lung Cancer Roundtable at the American Cancer Society. And we are so, so pleased that she is able to share some of her work with the roundtable with you today. Thank you much, Casey. And to everybody else who's been so instrumental in putting this Health Equity Coalition, I really enjoyed all the presentation this morning and I'm so honored to be able to spend a few minutes with you today talking about the National Lung Cancer Roundtable. Can you have the next slide, please? Next. The National Lung Cancer Roundtable was formally launched in 2017, and together we have got galvanized over 220 organizational members, including advocacy organizations, professional societies, cancer centers, health systems, state and federal government agencies, state coalitions and health plans to work together to improve the lives of those who have lung cancer. And importantly, towards issues that you've heard about today, health equity, early detection, and making sure that people who survive have the tools that they need to survive and thrive in their survivorship journey. And importantly, to make sure that the language that we use is welcoming and patient-centered in our stigma initiatives. This, no, this national coalition is dedicated to reducing that burden of lung cancer. And as Bob Smith, our pr principal investigator of the Cancer Society likes to say, we are not a talking shop. We are an action oriented group. We catalyze action within our team members and within our, our organizational members to do what is hard to do as individual professional societies, but together to tackle some of those sticky problems. And our goal fundamentally is to create lung cancer survivors. Next, please. What makes us unique? Given that we now represent one particular specialty or one particular aspect, we're a round table of organizations who all come together to try and understand what those sticky problems are to move things forward. We are part of a number of cancer round tables at the American Cancer Society with the newly launched National Breast Cancer Roundtable and Cervical Cancer Roundtable. And together, what we can do is effectively and efficiently in a neutral platform, harness that collective power and expertise of the entire cancer community to drive the national conversation, to push and change policy together. Our working groups of our organizations 
tackle some of those multidisciplinary problems that really are affected across professional organizations and state coalitions to make change possible. Together, we, fur we further the mission of our member organizations. We are certainly no substitute for the major efforts that happen through professional societies and state coalitions across the country. Closing the gaps in cancer care control is where our sweet spot is so that we can improve access, equity, and ultimately outcomes for patients. Next. The National Lung Cancer Roundtable, when it formed in 2017, launched five task groups and subsequently five more to tackle different aspects of the lung cancer continuum, from lung cancer screening and provider engagement to shared decision-making and survivorship. Our two most recently launched task groups in the last year are the survivorship task group, making sure that if we are able to create lung cancer survivors through early detection, advanced treatment, and smoking cessation, lung cancer screening improvements and care, that people can survive and thrive. And our health equity task group is focused specifically on the issues that have been a focus of today's session, which is how do we reach those who are most vulnerable and difficult to reach, who have challenges in access to health care that are not faced by everybody equally in this country so that we can make a difference in lung cancer. And importantly, when we look at those who are at risk for lung cancer, who are least likely to seek screening services and less likely to receive the latest advanced treatments, health equity is a particular issue. Next, please. Our new health equity and lung cancer task group is designed to address the unequal burden of risk, incidence, and mortality in these historically marginalized communities. By developing and implementing inclusive, sustainable, community-specific initiatives to encompass patient-centered and evidence-based care. At our annual, this annual National Lung Cancer Roundtable meeting this year, our keynote panel will be led by Dr. Alicia Perez-Stable, the director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities at the NIH. We'll be talking about disparities in lung cancer control metrics and outcomes, the research and clinical science gaps in diverse populations, the role of federally qualified health centers in lung cancer control, and the compounded stigma and trust that is necessary to overcome and build towards making sure that people who need lung cancer care can receive it and receive it in a timely manner. Next, please. As I mentioned, we're about action and it's about putting the discussions into action and developing tools and resources and implementation to make it possible for us to increase lung cancer survivorship in this country. From tools such as Lung Plan, which is a financial analysis tool that practices can use to help talk the financial language with their administrators to get the resources they need for their lung cancer screening programs, the nurse navigators, the connection to staff members, community health workers, the people that they need to make their lung cancer screening programs work. We've built a state-based initiative planning tool that allows states at whatever level of readiness they are to form state coalitions, to build those coalitions to reach people in their state, particularly those of the greatest need. We were honored to participate in the President's Cancer Panel for Lung Cancer and part of the Closing Gaps in Cancer Screening Report that was prepared. In essence, being a part of the President's Cancer Panel call to, call to action. This year, our annual meeting, our seventh annual meeting will be December 4th and 5th in Washington, DC. Next. I'd like to make sure to mention National Lung Cancer Screening Day. It's the second year that we're holding National Lung Cancer Screening Day, and this year it falls on November 11th, Saturday, which also happens to be Veterans Day. This day is designed to celebrate and save lives by encouraging facilities to open their radiology centers and screening programs on Saturday, November 11th to highlight the importance of lung cancer screening in their community. And many of our member organizations from the National Lung Cancer Roundtable are sponsors of this important effort. The GoTo Foundation for Lung Cancer is the major patient advocacy organization in lung cancer, the Radiology for Patients, the Radiology Health Equity Coalition, and the American College of Radiology. This year, because it falls on Veterans Day, we we're fortunate to work with folks in the Veterans Health Administration to bring the Veterans Health Administration facilities who have many at-risk individuals for lung cancer 
that need lung cancer screening to participate in Lung Cancer Screening Day across veteran health facilities in the United States, which is an added effort, another domain of health equity and service to patients who are at risk for lung cancer. And I hope you'll be celebrating this in your communities. Next. I'd importantly like to, to thank our American Cancer Society National Lung Cancer Roundtable sponsors. Without these sponsors, our work would not be possible. They, together with the many members and volunteers at the American Cancer Society and the National Lung Cancer Roundtable, are helping to drive change and create lung cancer survivors together. And we are so ever grateful for their participation and support of all these important efforts. They too share these goals. Next. So last, I would just like to thank you for being on this journey together with all of us. The National Lung Cancer Roundtable is our goal, our common goal here today is to create lung cancer survivors, to lower the impact of lung cancer through risk reduction, early detection, assurance of optimal diagnosis and therapy, whether it's proton therapy or biomarker therapy as you've heard today, and eliminating stigma. And to do so in a patient-centered, evidence-based manner that's inclusive, diverse, proactive, and visionary. Thanks so much for allowing me to spend a few minutes today talking to you about the National Lung Cancer Roundtable and how all of us together as a community can make a difference in the lives of patients with lung cancer. Thank you so much, Dr. Kazarini. We really appreciate you taking the time to be here today. Um, allow me to make a little plug for the National Lung Cancer Roundtable and American Cancer Society as evidence of the responsiveness of the two organizations. New lung cancer screening guidelines were released just yesterday, um, and we weren't able to dig into those today. Uh, but we just want to share that coming up on Monday, November 6th at 1 p.m., uh, we will be talking a little bit more about those guidelines. So please take the time to register for that uh, and learn more about what the new guidelines are um, and how you can be a part of this lung cancer screening journey, as Dr. Kazarini just mentioned. Um, on the next slide, just uh, want to share, uh, we could go ahead and actually do our final poll question as well. So based on your, um, oh, actually, so based on your observations, uh, the question I think might be wrong for this, but uh, among those that you serve, which population groups face the greatest barrier, barriers to lung cancer screening? So the question should be for those answers. So for those that you serve, which population groups uh, do you feel that you've worked with have the greatest barriers to lung cancer screening, lung cancer health equity? And we'll take a few seconds to go ahead. You can choose multiple groups. Also want to make a plug that uh, we do hope to have a 2024 virtual series again. Um, we are busy working out some details around that, what it might look like. So please stay tuned for that as well. Um, I know that we've got just a few minutes here and I just want to let everyone know that the CME certificates will be sent out in two weeks. Um, in order to receive that certificate, you must complete the post-event survey. The survey should pop up at the close of today's session. If for some reason it does not, you will also receive a post-event email uh, with the recording of the session and the survey link again, in case you have missed it this morning. So just a reminder, in order to get that CME certificate, you must fill out that survey link. That's what we, we use to account for attendance for attending to this morning. Um, and, and again, you the CME certificates will be emailed to you in two weeks. So finally, I just want to say thank you again for being on this journey with us. Um, I hope that you found at least one or two nuggets of inspiration, one or two ideas that are new to you. Um, and I hope that you'll join us in taking the next steps to improving health equity and lung cancer. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you for your commitment to fight for a world without cancer.